Good morning to all of you. My name is Jessica Holmes, and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. So today is day two of our uh, Green Mountain Care Board hospital budget hearing process. Just as a reminder, um, I said this on Monday, but I'll say it again today. I'll say it at the start of every uh, hearing day that we have to conduct our analysis and ultimately make a decision for each hospital. We have to look to our statute and our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Our review requires us to balance several often competing factors. For example, the need to slow the growth in healthcare expenditures while also ensuring that our hospitals have the resources they need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and provide the high quality care we expect in our communities. As we're looking to balance you know, these competing factors of cost containment, access, quality, and health system sustainability, we have to be mindful of this year's unique circumstances uh, and the significant headwinds that we're facing. We have historically high inflation rates, workforce shortages, and the continuing impacts of COVID-19. So both nationally and in Vermont, we're seeing hospitals facing unprecedented financial challenges as our businesses, families, and individuals. So. What lies before us is not easy. I think we all know that. Our short-term task is to set fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for the 14 community hospitals, and we have to do this by September 25th, I mean, September 15th, sorry. Uh, with that said, I wanna remind everybody that the board is working closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work that outlined in Act 167 which aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that's going to ensure better ensure that Vermonters have access to high quality, affordable care. That longer term work is going to involve extensive data analysis and community and hospital engagement to identify options for a more sustainable path forward. So as we return to the task at hand, I want to extend a thank you to each of the hospitals presenting today for the time and effort taken to submit the documents for our review. There's a few housekeeping no notes for today. Um, the presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed. So there will be a publicly available record. If any hospital's leadership believes that there's confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of the hospital's presentation or in response to board or staff questions, please alert us before responding. If needed, the Green Mountain Care Board has the ability to go into executive session to review confidential information from hospitals. I just want to note, though, that executive se sessions are limited in scope as provided by the open meeting law, and they're limited to information such as contracts and information that would be considered confidential under the Public Records Act. So if an issue of possible confidentiality arises, I'll call on the board's legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in executive session, and if deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, I'll ask the board member for a motion uh, for us to go into that executive session. So knowing we have a really tight schedule today, we have three hospitals um, that we wanna hear from. Uh, I'm gonna hold all board and staff questions until the end of each hospital's presentation. And I see all the board members, Tom, Tom and Robin. So all our board members are here. Sarah Lindbergh, you're on hopefully in the background. Should always be checking to make sure that you're there too and your team. Um, Springfield, it looks like I see Springfield's team. Is everybody from your team all here? We we are, Jessica. It'll be Kata and I presenting today. Okay, wonderful. All right, perfect. Um, so in keeping with the schedule, I'm gonna uh, hold all of our board and staff questions until the end of your presentation, uh, which I we have scheduled, I think it was till 1.15. Um, Russ, would you mind swearing in um, the, the Springfield witnesses for us? Great, yeah, happy to. This is uh, Russ McCracken, staff attorney with the board. Um, Bob, I believe you said you and Kata will be the two uh, speaking today, is that right? That's right. We may call on Mike Donahue, who is a consultant who has assisted us in the preparation, so we might want to do Mike as well. Okay. Yeah, I think we should swear in anybody who might be who might be speaking. Um, so if you could all uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. 
Great, thank you. Uh, you're sworn in, and it would be helpful if the first time you speak, you could identify yourself by name. That will help with the re recording and the transcription. Great. I might add that every time you speak, it might be helpful to just remind, for the court reporter's sake, who is speaking. So that would be really helpful. So thank you for coming. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you for submitting all your materials to us. Um, you know, we will be, we poured over them. We're going to be pouring over them again, and we look forward to your presentation today. So if you want to, I will turn it over to you. If you've got a present, your presentation, you want to load that up, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, happy to be here today to tell our hospital's story for what happened this year and what we expect to happen in the year upcoming. I would, we're, going to have Crystal Moray on our team uh, run the slide deck, so I'm not sure if Crystal is trying to get access so we can put our slides up. I don't know if somebody has to. I emailed Kara for per that permission. Yeah, Kara is the one helping drive that behind the scenes slide ship. So great. Looks and, like, uh, done looks like her yeah. slides are coming up. Great. OK, so if um, again, I'm Robert Adcock. I go by Bob, so um, please feel free to, to use that. Uh, so we're happy to be here today, and we'll get started. Um, our introduction slide, we think, is very representative of the status of healthcare, not only in Vermont, but in America right now. I mean, we live in a world of chaos in healthcare uh, with all the uh, external and internal forces that are affecting us. And, and we so we believe the concrete represents the uh, the challenging world around us and the world of chaos that we're in. And the green sprig there is our, is our hospital um, thriving and growing in this hostile environment. So we're fragile yet persevering in this world uh, that is very much uh, has hospitals in America under assault. So next slide, please. We wanted to start off just by reminding everyone on the call what's happening with healthcare, not only in Vermont, but across America. So we picked a few headlines, uh, all of them national headlines, just to kind of emphasize what's happening uh, with hospitals. Um, all across America, hospitals are struggling with negative margins in red ink. Uh, just a few headlines here about that. Um, every hospital in America is struggling with high rates of inflation, troubles uh, recruiting staff, difficulties in getting supplies, and um, many of us, if not most of us, are relying heavily on traveler staff to, to provide daily routine care at our hospitals. So uh, chaos in the hospitals, yes. Are we able, we fighting and persevering through that? Absolutely. So um, next slide, please. We'll start with just a little introduction to introduce Springfield Hospital to everyone on the call. We are a 25 bed critical access hospital located in Springfield, Vermont. We have 25 med surge and swing beds and 10 mental health beds, which are at an offsite location in Bellows Falls, Vermont. Um, our inpatient daily census and the stats on this slide are all year, fiscal year to date, 531.22. So our inpatient average daily census is eight and a half on the acute side, 1.2 on swing, and 7.4 on mental health. Our ER visits, we are year to date through May, we are averaging about 35 visits a day, although we have seen uh, a remarkable increase in that the last quarter. Uh, we've seen an average of 39 in May, 38 in June and 37 in July. So we definitely are seeing an uptick on emergency care. Um, surgery volume, pretty robust for us. Uh, this includes 1,300 cases through 531, including endoscopy cases, 11,400 specialty clinics, and this excludes uh, referred outpatients, you know, lab and x-ray type. These are our, our clinic visits. We have 390 employees in, that work in our hospital, and we have a gigantic 
economic impact on our community. Uh, we're expecting our payroll for 22 with benefits to be about $23 million without the $4 million we're going to pay this year to traveler and temporary staff that we're being forced to rely on. Uh, we're budgeting that number to be about $25 million for FY23. So lo very large economic impact to our local economy. Next slide, please. And we'll start off uh, kind of the segue to this slide. We'll start off with the unprecedented workforce challenges that we're seeing here in Springfield. And again, this is uh, typical not only of hospitals in Vermont, but also across America. Uh, we have seen uh, unimaginable traveler costs that have been required to staff our hospital this year. Um, we're projecting to spend about $4 million to, for traveler costs this year, which is up more than double what we saw la in last fiscal year. Um, a year ago when we were here, we felt like this was uh, getting better, um, but obviously the market really, uh, really destabilized and decompensated on us. And I think that we've seen this across across every hospital in the state. Um, again, our extraordinary rate increases in travelers. Uh, this slide is 531. It has 52 vacancies. Right now, today, um, we actually have 61 total vacancies. 15 of those vacancies are registered nurses, uh, one medical technologist, three respiratory, and three radiology technologists. So all very uh, scarce and difficult to recruit positions in rural Vermont right now. Um, what are we doing? I mean, we're not uh, we're not sitting still. We are very aggressively uh, trying to impact uh, our team here in, in our um, our labor group. Um, we're making investments in our budget. We have a 2% cost of living increase budgeted. Uh, we're budgeting additional training and workforce development. We have hired a dedicated recruiter to help us um, fill difficult positions. And we've introduced two programs to help us try to reduce travelers. One is our premium per diem program, and the other is an extra hour bonus program. And both of those are designed to um, encourage our existing staff to accept more shifts and allow us to um, um, divert some of that extra money to our own family rather than pay it to travelers. Next slide, please. We will talk a little bit about, about infrastructure. Um, all hospitals are, are having trouble making, uh, recapitalizing and reinvesting in their plant and equipment. Um, right now, we're, we believe we have the second oldest hospital plant in Vermont. At the average age of our facilities is right at 21 years. Um, the statewide average ranges from eight, eight and a half years to 22 years. Um, and the national median for critical access hospitals is about 12 and a half years. Um, we, as we progress through the, pro, to the process today, you'll see we have budgeted $1.5 million for priority capital reinvestment this year. And in addition to that, we have received some grant income that we're going to put towards the building. Um, we have several projects that are important for us this year. Uh, the main ones are around our, our HVAC uh, mechanical systems in the hospital, and we believe that most of that we will be able to fund with grant grants that we have applied for and received. So we will be uh, reinvesting in our infrastructure this year ba based on those opportunities. Next slide, please. Talk a little bit about the environment we're working in. Um, you know, the healthcare environment is very stressed right now. I've made a list here of just a few of the things that are impacting us on a, a daily basis, one of which is patients that are boarding in the emergency room. And I'll draw some distinctions here because there are several categories that are that are impacting us. Uh, the one that is affecting us more than any have been the patients that have been here that are not meeting hospital criteria, but have no, no post-acute discharge plan, and many of them have not met criteria for a post-discharge um, 
plan. They just didn't have a safe discharge plan because they didn't have the right conditions at home or they didn't have family members or, or any other caregivers to take care of them. So we've had several of those patients uh, which have been with us for a considerable amount of time. Uh, they are non-reimbursed while at the same time we are incurring costs. Um, excuse me. To feed them, provide pharmaceuticals, linen, and, and nursing care. Excuse me. Um, just going through here, we do have our Wyndham Center psychiatric facility that does provide us with a benefit for placing mental health patients. <laughs> we we still have challenging patients that we're not able to place. Uh, that you know might be forensic or other conditions that we're not able to take care of in our own facilities. Um, post acute, as I mentioned, post acute placements remain a challenge for us. Um, many of of the post acute de destinations in our area are facing the same type of hurdles we have around inflation, increasing staffing costs, and many of them have reduced their beds and capacity. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we do have we have an advantage because we do have the ability as a critical access hospital to accept swing bed patients and we do accept those and we work daily with some of our partners in the area particularly uh, with Dartmouth and UVM to try to make our beds available to assist with their discharge planning we do have that problem sometimes that the patients they're trying to place also don't meet the criteria to be placed in our beds but we are uh, we are in contact with those hospitals on a daily basis to make our resources available to help them as well. Um, a new one that's coming up is the stress that's also being placed on the emergency medical system in our area. Um, our EMS providers do a fantastic job for us, uh, but we have we frequently encounter situations where we have to uh, take staff to accompany our patients when they're on an EMS transfer. And uh, that's taking nursing nursing staff out of the hospital, but many times to meet the clinical needs of the patient and the resources available, we're we're uh, compelled to do that. So uh, that is starting to affect us as as well. Next slide, please. I'm gonna... Major challenges. Well, we have a lot of a lot of a lot of challenges uh, at the hospital. Uh, in addition to quite a few opportunities, which we'll also be talking about those, but we'll talk about the challenges first. Um, again, we have you know in our community, we have a relatively poor payer mix, and reimbursement is relatively low for the work that we do. Um, we are are now bargaining in good faith. Um, our nurses recently voted um, to be represented by a union and by a collective bargaining agreement, and we're now negotiating in good faith for that contract. We are still working through the um, the post. Um, the, I'm not sure what the right word is. The post the post uh, work that we're doing uh, from our chapter 11. I mean, we emerged from Chapter 11 previously, and as a part of that, we restructured our our organization. As many of you may remember, we were previously owned by the FQHC in town, which is now known as North Star uh, Health, previously known as Springfield Medical Care Systems. So we are we even though we have emerged from Chapter 11, we have separated into two companies. We still work very closely with North Star and we were still working through details of that the vestiture and that split. Um, again, can't un can't under emphasize the challenges we're facing now with workforce shortages. I mean, it seems like every uh, position in the hospital is difficult to fill. Uh, bar none, there are, there are no positions in the hospital that, that are easy to recruit for right now despite our uh, competitive salaries in our benefit programs. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about travelers. We're expecting to spend about $4 million this year for travelers, which is an incredible burden for a small hospital like ours. Supply chain shortages at any given day, we're looking at approximately 60 to 70 items that are back ordered. And uh, that's not always the same 60 or 70, it's moving around. 
our supply chain and materials management department do a fantastic job um, searching around and trying to keep all the supplies we need in the hospital. One of the byproducts of this um, challenge has been a lot of times now we're buying supplies that are more expensive than we bought before because we're unable to get the ones that we were using previously. And sometimes, you know, we have a very good GPO as a member of NIA, but sometimes we're forced to use alternative products that are more costly. Inflation and rising cost, again, everyone's subject to inflation. Uh, the, uh, the oil we use to, to heat our facilities and run our boilers uh, cost more than twice what it did last year. So, um, and then finally, um, we had quite a challenge and quite an impact in the fall when the Omicron and Delta variants hit our areas. And um, we, the last time we were before this board, we were actually um, experiencing very strong volumes at the hospital, and those volumes were giving us very favorable uh, patient revenue numbers. But when the variants hit in the fall, uh, it had a significant impact on us. So if we could go to the next slide, please. This slide was designed to show just how pervasive that impact was on our hospital. Um, so here you can see that the black line is the positive number of cases uh, per day, and the red line is the seven-day moving average for positive cases in Vermont. And you can see when we presented last to you in November, you could see that our uh, gross revenue was actually quite strong, and we were we were we were in the midst of a very robust recovery at the hospital. Then, when the variant started hitting us, uh, the revenue took quite a plunge. Now, over in the winter and spring, the revenue started turning back up again. But this big slump in the middle of the year has affected us pretty profoundly. Next slide, please. We have a number of operational changes that we have been working working on. Um, again, I want to emphasize the fact that Springfield is very uh, very much involved in collaborating with our colleagues and our partners in the area. Uh, the right hand slide of this the right hand part of this slide was designed to demonstrate that just to show the various partnerships and relationships that we have in the marketplace. Of course, our main one is with the FQHC, now known as North Star. So even though we're not the same organization anymore, we share a um, very strong partnership and we do continue the uh, the shared services agreement. We're, we're able to share costs between the two organizations. Um, again, you can see some of the other things that we have. I mean, we partner with Dartmouth for the radiology department for our oncology service. Um, we partner with UVM. They provide our pathology and oversee our laboratory. Um, Brattleboro has their obstetrics doctors here. Uh, Cheshire has their cardiologists here. Um, we contract with a regional group for emergency and hospital care, which is uh, Blue Water Health. And then as you go through the service lines, uh, these are these are all service lines that uh, um, you know are important things to us that we provide for our community. Let's see, going through just to, just to name a few others, uh, what's happening in our hospital. Well, last year we brought on a podiatrist. There was no podiatrist in Springfield at that time. And so that provider has had a remarkable upswing and growth in his practice. Um, we're in the process now of, we just increased him from eight days a month to 10 days a month on our campus. Urology, uh, has been a one day a week service, and it, we're in the process of expanding that to two days a week. Uh, we had two a year ago. We had two part time gynecology providers. Um, they have left our marketplace, and now we're replacing them with one full time provider who will give us more appointments and more on site access, with, to allow us to better meet the needs in our marketplace for that service line. And then a new program we'll be starting this year is an interventional pain management program. Uh, that service is not available in Springfield, and we believe that there is a need for that here in our marketplace. So next slide. Uh, talk a little bit uh, 
about our Wyndham Center. Uh, we during this fiscal year we have made a slight restructuring to our provider model, uh, which we are phasing in more mid-level hours and more mid-level care and relying on a part-time medical director. Um, I want to want to just mention that our utilization this year has been reduced. We had a number of days in the winter at the height of the season where we had staffing issues primarily related to, to COVID among our staff or staff members that had to be quarantined due to exposure. Um, that affected our volume and our capacity quite a bit in the wintertime. Um, and just remind everybody the work we did with Wyndham in the two previous fiscal years when we actually put the unit on standby to be the provider for COVID positive psych patients for the state. And so now we're, we've been fully operational uh, since the spring of last year and looking forward to continue to strengthen and grow that program, particularly around meeting the needs that we have in the state. I know everybody has needs for uh, beds to discharge their psych patients to. So we're working hard to, to meet that need. I'll comment a little bit about our oncology service. It has historically been staffed by Dartmouth. Uh, we have switched that model from an on on-site in-person model to a um, telemedicine model, and, and that has restricted the patients that we can provide chemotherapy for on-site. And so we are finishing up some patients that were in progress, but we are not initiating any new chemotherapy pa patients uh, with the doctors not on-site. Next slide, please. I think this slide um, really characterizes the, the incredible balancing act that we're doing here in our small hospital in Springfield. I mean, you know, this is a very resilient critical access hospital. Um, we are in a very fragile financial position, although our operating results are uh, improved quite a bit from the prior year, we're still in a very fragile position. Um, we're expecting an operating margin of 0.5% this year. Um, we're, we're projecting our operating income to be about $312,000. And again, these numbers are based on our 531 year to date estimates. Um, and I'll point out that these numbers also rely heavily on us taking grant funding into income for the year, um, ARPA uh, provider relief funding and a USDA grant. And we've also received some grants for our, our adult daycare program as well. So these, uh, projected numbers for 22 are relying on us taking those into income. Next slide, please. Our goals for the for this year um, really fall around financial stabilization. I mean, we've been through a lot of turmoil in this hospital the last three or four years. As you recall, we have gone through significant turnover in our leadership team. And that team was completely restructured. Um, while that was going on, the hospital also entered Chapter 11 and went through the stress and struggles of that process. Uh, while that was ongoing, the COVID pandemic hit the marketplace and really changed the whole dynamics of healthcare in in the country. And um, then, as part of that restructuring under Chapter 11, we split with our parent organization, uh, which is the FQAC. Um, so our goals, though, are are to move in 23 towards continuing to improve our financial stabilization uh, to make local and affordable access for care available to our local community uh, to provide for patient and staff safety and to serve our community, which tends to be an aging population, lower income community, um, lower health status compared to the averages we see in the state and rising substance misuse and mental health needs. So all of these things are goals for us to address in our FY23 budget. Next slide, please. Our vision and mission remains the same. It's unchanged. It's to excel at providing personalized and quality care. I mean, our, our motto is where people come first. That's our hospital for our community. And our vision is to be the provider of choice by creating a professional environment where patients want to receive care 
clinicians want to practice and employees want to work. And um, we put this photo of one of our staff members here in the rain um, providing. Uh, we were called upon in the fall last year to test 600 children in the local school district who uh, were possibly exposed to COVID. And um, we worked with the Department of Health uh, and our community leaders. And within a few days, we were able to put on um, like an immediate screening pr process and we had people bring their children in the cars while our staff stood in the rain and provided testing for that group of, for that group so we could um, clear them so just want to just a, one example of the the important work that's being done at our hospital for our community next slide please okay i think i'm going to def defer to Kata to start talking about the financial numbers Okay, um, for the reporter, reporter, I'll say my name, um, Kata Westcott. C-O-T-T, and I am the Chief Financial Officer for Springfield Hospital. Um, just want to thank the board and everyone for um, having us here this afternoon to present the budget. Um, I will be going over the financial portion of the budget, and we'll start with this slide, which talks about, um, summarizes our net patient revenue request and our charge request. Um, our 23 NPR request, um, you can see on the right-hand side is 58.7 million. Um, our 22 ab approved NPR budget was 54.6 million. That's a seven and a half percent increase um, budget to budget. Our projected NPR for 22 is 51.7. Um, that's a 13.7% increase um, from the 22 projected to our 23 NPR. Um, that 51.7 projected number for, for NPR um, was definitely impacted by the volume and lower revenues that we experienced this year as a result of the, the two different COVID variants that hit us. Um, starting in January, as Bob just showed in the slide. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, our NPR re request is or increase is made up of three different components. We have increased utilization from our current services, increased utilization from a new program initiative, as well as a rate increase. Next slide. So this slide is a breakdown um, showing the components of NPR and their and the 23 NPR um, increases compared to projected and compared to budget. So on the left hand side shows the comparison of the 23 budget to the 22 projected. So starting at the top, and I'll just quickly walk through this, our projected NPR. Um, for 22 was 51.7. And if you go to the bottom, you can see our NPR budget is 58.7. That's a $7 million increase. The components of that $7 million increase is 4.8 million from utilization, 2.7 from rate, and a decrease in NPR um, from our DISH, bad debt, and charity. Um, on the right-hand side shows the increase um, budget to budget. So from our 22 budget of 54.6 million, um, that's a $4 million increase when you compare that to the budget of 58.7 million for 23. Um, the components of that is a $1.9 million increase in utilization and a $2.8 million increase in rate. And we'll talk um, in a few slides from now about where the utilization changes are coming from. Next slide, please. So this slide, the next couple of slides, just basically reiterate what we just saw in that side-by-side -side table, where this is just outlining the 23 NPR um, incremental change from the 22 projected NPR, um, which was $7 million. 
um, where $2.7 million of the $7 million increase is related to the rate increase. It's primarily coming from our commercial payers. $4.8 million of the $7 million increase is coming from utilization. And then we're seeing a $500,000 um, decrease in NPR, um, which is the combination of our DISH, bad debt, and charity care. Um, a small portion of that is budgeted to be a decrease in the DISH. Most of the $500,000 decrease in NPR is due to an increase in the bad debt and charity care as a result of the increase um, in gross patient revenue. Next slide. Um, this slide is, um, again, a reiteration of the, the table that we just saw um, showing the change from net patient revenue. This is budget to budget, um, which was a $4 million increase. 2.8 million of that is the rate. Um, 1.9 million of that 4 million increase is utilization. And then there's a $700,000 decrease in net patient revenue. Um, which is a combination of DISH, bad debt, and free care. Um, again, the DISH portion of that is relatively small. Um, the biggest part of the, the 700000 is the increased bad debt and free care as a result of the increase in gross revenue. Um, we're budgeting minimal changes for our fixed prospective payments, um, which were in for Medicaid, Blue Cross, and MVP. Next slide. Okay, thank you, Kata. Um, this slide just, the goal of this slide is to outline our utilization changes, which, um, you know, we have a lot, we spent a lot of time this year um, determining what are the needed services in our community and what are the things that are underserved and where do we need to address access and uh, entry points in care here. And so a lot of our utilization increase is built around in strengthening vol our volume and meeting, doing a better job of meeting those needs in, in the marketplace. So um, a big portion of it is increase in surgery uh, due to adding the full-time GYN physician, um, the increase in days for urology and for podiatry, which again are, are very, very scarce services. All three of those are very scarce services in our marketplace. Um, we have budgeted a corresponding increase, small increase in medical surgical census, as which we expect to be driven by those increases in surgery from GYN and urology. Uh, probably don't expect much from podiatry, but for the other two, we expect to have some a slight increase in, in our inpatient utilization. And again, we've also budgeted an increase in psychiatry. So right now we're running about seven and a half is our ADC in psychiatry, and we're budgeting to move that to eight and a half in, in FY23. And we believe with um, the demand that's in the marketplace, we believe that's a very doable goal for us. Um, we also see increases in diagnostic imaging and in physical therapy. Um, and we, and of course, the emergency department, we um, are budgeting, um, and a slight increase in emergency room visits. And we feel very uh, strong that that's a conservative number, particularly based on the run rate we're seeing right now. Again, in July, we saw 37 a day, 38 a day in June, and 39 a day in May. So we feel like that's a very conservative increase that we're budgeting on the emergency department. Um, our new pain management program, um, we're budgeting an increase with that. And those are partially offset by a decrease in oncology as we are projecting a decrease in our visits, did our visits for chemotherapy as that has now become mostly a telemedicine clinic. Next slide, please. So these are our key utilization statistics comparing our prior year and in, in year over year. And, um, you know, we've been through quite a bit of uh, turmoil, uh, but if you look at our, our 23 budget is the yellow column in the middle. And again, we're showing a slight increase 
um, versus 22 projected primarily based on the increase in days for the due to the surgery increases. Um, a, a increase also in our swing our swing volume because we are still working very hard to make that asset available to our colleague hospitals for the, to help them with their throughput challenges that they have. Uh, and again, we we think that we can do better with we can we can increase our census and psych, particularly if we don't uh, have those issues around our staff staffing shortages that we had this winter, particularly. And again, you can see the corresponding increases in census that we're expecting as well there in the yellow column. Uh, so med surge uh, swing psychiatry going to 8.5. Uh, in observation, uh, actually going down a little bit from 1.6 to 1.3 in terms of census. Emergency department, uh, again, budgeting to go from 34.7 to 35.5. Uh, um, but we feel like that's a conservative number now based on the volume that we're experiencing right now over the last quarter. And again, in, in the operating room, in our endoscopy suite, um, we were expecting, um, you know, increases in cases in those areas around the increase in urology and having the availability of the full-time gynecologist here on site. Um, next slide, please. Actually, um, I just had a couple of comments on the the statistics before we move on. Oh, please. Um, I just wanted to point out um, when we're looking at the fiscal year 21 actual and then comparing to the 23 budget, particularly for the psych psychiatric admissions and the psychiatric daily census, you can see that they're almost in half. Um, the admissions in the, the census was half in 21 than what it is um, now and what is budgeted to be for next year. Um, and that's because in 21, um, the first half of the year, we were operating as a COVID unit. During that first half of the year, um, we have an eight, we had an ADC of less than one patient a day. Um, and so the last half of 21, we became fully operational. And so um, 22, we were fully operational. And then in 23, um, you know, still continuing to be fully operational. Um, we did have less admissions um, for psych this year. Not much than what we had budgeted, but we had some issues that impacted um, the the census due to staff being out um, that had COVID. Um, we also had some facility issues with one of our rooms down there, which um, limited our census. Um, so just wanted to point out those couple of things on the inpatient psych. Um, I also wanted to point out on the med surge um, admissions and average daily census, you can see from 21 to 23, we're budgeting less admissions next year than what we had in 21, although the average daily census is higher at 9.3. Um, it was 8.9 in 21. Some of that is due to the increased sur surgeries that we're budgeting next year that Bob just talked about, but some of it is also due to a longer length of stay that we're seeing for our patients on the med surge unit. Um, that's due to keeping the patients longer because we're having challenges um, discharging patients um, to lower level facilities such as nursing homes and also to higher level facilities um, for tertiary care availability. So longer length of stay we're seeing um, this year and we're budgeting for next year than what we experienced in 21. Um, Bob mentioned for the emergency department that we're comfortable with the 35.5 patients a day that we're budgeting next year. When looking at the projected this year of 34.7, that's May, based on our May year-to-date. Um, when we look at our July year-to-date number, that year-to-date average is 35.8. So, so far this year, we're already seeing um, what we're budgeting for next year. Um, it's just not reflected on the slide um, because the projected was an older number. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to comment on the OR cases. Um, so while the OR cases are increasing compared to projected for this year due to the reasons that Bob outlined um, due to urology um, and gynecology predominantly, the 
the amount that's or the volume that's budgeted for 23 is still less than um, what we were experiencing um, in pre pandemic levels, which was over 1100 cases. Um, so just wanted to point those few things out on the on the utilization. Next slide, please. Well, thank you, Kate. And I think when we when we get to talking about the net patient revenue, you'll see the Wyndham impact again because in the prior year, year, the change between those years on the net patient revenue will be reflected due, due to the times when Wyndham was closed or offline for COVID. Um, this slide is showing our net patient revenue by payer um, as a percentage of total NPR. Um, it, we have a column for the 23 budget, the 22 projected and the 22 budget, basically just demonstrating that there's no significant changes um, by payer as a total of the, the total um, NPR. Um, not a lot to talk about on this slide other than there's no significant changes um, when talking about the net patient revenue by payer. Next slide, please. Um, this slide outlines our NPR payer assumptions that we use when calculating the net patient revenue. Um, basically, our methodologies for calculating net patient revenue is consistent from year to year. We haven't changed our methodologies. Um, for Medicare, our net patient revenue is calculated based on the critical access cost-based model, which uses our budgeted revenue and expenses. Um, as a critical access hospital, we are reimbursed based on um, one and a half, not one and a half, 101 percent of our allowable costs. Um, and then deducted from that is about two percent of sequestration. Um, Medicaid, we're not getting or we're not assuming a lot of the um, rate increase is going to be um, impacted by Medicaid. Um, the only thing that we're the only increase that we're budgeting for from Medicaid is a 2.7% inflation increase, which um, is on top of our 22 projected payments. Um, commercial NPR is based on um, gross charges and then is subject to the payment limits that are within um, our commercial contracts, which is there, there's a wide variability of those contracts of um, what they are. Some honor the full um, rate increase and some have caps. So all of those are taken into consideration based on um, the commercial payer. And then lastly, self-pay um, for our budget assumptions, we're assuming the same bad debt and charity percentages as a percentage of gross patient revenue that we're currently seeing this year. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a a summary of our charge request. Um, our fiscal year 22 approved charge request was 8.3%. Our 23 request is 10%. Next slide. I think Bob, you're talking about this slide. Whoops, sorry, I was muted. I'll recap the adjustments again on the utilization side from our 22 projected. Again, in um, October of last year, we launched the podiatry service and it has been a real, uh, it's been a real success story for us, starting at one day a week, growing to two. And, you know, then we were at, we've been at uh, two days a week and now we're going in August to 10 days a month. And so that schedule is very full. Um, when we get over to the wait times, you'll see that that's one of the areas where we needed to expand to accommodate and improve the wait times. Um, we are recruiting one general surgeon. We've historically had two here at this hospital. So we have one full time one now and we're um, filling in his coverage with locums physicians now, but we're budgeting to add a second general surgeon in January that would be here full time. Uh, we are transitioning to two part time gynecology surgeons that we have had for several years to one full time physician 
um, in September. And we're also recruiting some additional support for that doctor to help in surgery, help with call, and, um, and with larger cases. In urology, we've had the urology group coming one day a week, and now they're increasing to two days a week. Uh, that's a very a service that's in very short supply in our area. And then again, pain management, uh, which um, is a new service for us. So this slide is talking about our other operating and non-operating revenue. Um, budget to budget, we there is a, a $391,000 increase um, from 22. Um, 22 projected to budget, we are budgeting a $3 million decrease from the 22 projected. Um, this year we're projecting for 22, a $5.9 million um, other operating revenue, whereas in 23, we're projecting 2.8. And so that difference is related to what Bob um, talked about in an earlier slide, where this year we're estimating that we're going to be um, recognizing about $3.5 million in COVID relief funds. Um, One million of that is related to USDA COVID relief funding, which we received in May of, of 2022. Um, that was an application that we made or applied for back in the fall that was based on lost revenues um, from prior years. We received that money in May and we recorded the revenue for that in May. Um, there's also $2.5 million related to provider relief and ARPA funding that we believe we're gonna be taking into income by year end. Um, we still need to go through the calculations um, for that and probably we'll do so at year end, but we think we can take um, that as a result of our high cost and travelers that we've been experiencing. Um, our other operating route, operating room, other operating revenue sources, we have four major sources of operating revenue um, that we're budgeting for. Uh, one is our adult day program. The second is our master shared services agreement with North Star Health, which was formerly Springfield Medical Care Systems. Um, that's where we share administrative staff um, with the FQHC. Um, we also have in our other operating revenue, grant revenue. Um, we were conservative with the grant revenue that we're budgeting for. We have about $500,000 in there um, that we budgeted. Um, we will be applying for the FEMA grant um, by the end of September. Um, so we're definitely pursuing that, but we're being conservative um, in what we're estimating for revenue. And then lastly, um, provider relief funding. So we're not anticipating any new funding for 23 in our budget, um, but we did receive um, 2.8 million for ARPA and um, provider relief funding in November and May of 21. So of that 2.8 million, we estimate that we're gonna um, be able to recognize 2.5 million in the 22 um, projected and the remainder of that 300,000 we have for um, 23. And we have no significant non-operating items budgeted for 23. Next slide, please. Okay, so on to, so that was um, the revenue portion. So on to um, operating expenses, and this is compared to 22 projected operating expenses, of which um, we're budgeting a $2.6 million increase projected to budget, which is 4.5%. Um, we have included in there about 5.5% for inflation increases for supplies, drugs, outside services, utilities, et cetera. Um, salaries and wages um, are projected to increase $2.2 million, and that's the largest um, portion of the expense increase. Um, that has several components to that. One, which is the bulk of the salaries and wages increase is that we're continuing to budget for positions that were budgeted in 22 that were not filled. Um, we also have the 2% uh, cost of living adjustment that we're budgeting for December. We had a 2% COLA um, last December. We also have market adjustments that we're budgeting for for next year as we're anticipating increases um, that are necessary to remain competitive. And we also had to make um, 
market adjustments this fiscal year um, in order to retain um, necessary staff that were going to go elsewhere. Um, and then lastly, included in the, the salaries and wages increase, we also have some new staff positions to support volume growth and some of the utilization um, increases that we had talked about. Um, travelers um, projected a budget. We are anticipating to decrease um, about a million dollars from where we think they're going to be this year, which Bob had mentioned. Um, we're going to end the year with an anticipated $4 million in traveler expenses. Next year, we had budgeted about 2.8. Uh, so decrease from what we're experiencing this year to next year. Um, some of that is related to the programs that Bob briefly talked about that we're doing with our current staff, um, where we have a premium per diem program, um, an extra hours program, and we're also utiliz utilizing um, international staff in several different areas. Um, and that staff is um, about one and a half times what we would pay um, our own staff, but about 50% less than what we would pay um, for travelers. So we're saving a lot of money um, in that. Um, employee benefits, we're expecting to increase uh, 481,000. Um, that's related to increases in our health insurance plan, um, payroll taxes related to the increased salaries and wages. Um, we also have in here a full year of our 401k match, um, which we started back up again in this fiscal year in January. So um, only nine months of 22, we have the 401k match, but we're um, including that for a full year in 23. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, some of our um, reasons for the operating expense increase from projected uh, medical supplies are expected to go up over 300,000, primarily volume and inflation related. Um, other purchase services are projected to go up over 200,000 um, with some of our contracts that we have in security, um, our reference lab services, diagnostic imaging, um, and then that 200,000 includes inflation. Um, drugs, um, we're expecting to decrease a net of 500,000 as a result of reducing the oncology utilization. And then um, recruiting and advertising will increase by just under 300,000 as a result of increased uh, marketing efforts. Um, next slide, please. So these are the, this is operating expenses versus our 22 budget um, is an increase of 4.8 million budget to budget. Um, basically is the same increases that I just talked about versus projected with the, the wages, um, inflation, volume related increases. Um, the wage portion of that is about 1.2 million. Um, the largest budget to budget increase is because of um, under budgeting for our travelers for 22. Um, we had budgeted in 22. $1.3 million. And like we mentioned at the end of the year, we think we're going to have $4 million for 22 projected. Um, but next year, we think we're going to have less than that with $2.8 million. So um, budget to budget, however, that's a $1.6 million increase for travelers. And then lastly, um, another portion of our operating expense increase budget to budget is the provider tax. Um, increase, which is 6% of our NPR increase. And that's about roughly 700,000. Next slide, please. Um, our fiscal year 23 operating margin, we're budgeting an operating margin of $1.7 million, which is 2.8%. That will cover our expenses plus our um, principal debt payments. Um, it will allow us to invest in high priority capital improvements that we have not been able to make um, for many years, in, you know, since Chapter 11. Um, and then also to make our required annual contributions to our frozen defined benefit plan. Um, our operating margin is going to allow us to basically maintain our balance sheet and cash reserves. Um, 
and stabilize them. Next slide. Um, the 23 budget um, supported by the 10% charge increase is a needs, needs based budget. And as I just mentioned, only projects the hospital to maintain our cash reserves. Um, in summary, the operating margin is based on our current volume, um, plus making adjustments for the utilization changes that we had talked about for 23. It builds in our rate adjustment, um, but it also includes um, budgeted costs that are necessary to invest and retain our staff, uh, make facility and capital improvements, um, also allows us to have adequate resources to care for our patients and includes the cost pressures that we've experienced in 22 that were unforeseen and then builds in additional inflation for next year. Next slide, please. Um, this is our income statement. Um, so I will go through some of the highlights of this, some of which we've already talked about. Um, our 21, it starts with a 21 actual in the first column. Um, again, wanted to point out that for gross patient revenue and net patient revenue, um, our inpatient psych unit um, was um, operating as a COVID unit the first half of that year. And because we had a low ADC of less than one, um, the gross patient revenue and net patient revenue was lower. Um, but that was offset by grant revenue that we received by the state to help support that program. And that grant revenue from the state was recorded under other operating revenue in 21, which is why you can see that $4 million includes about a million and a half of grant funding from the state to support um, the inpatient site program as a COVID unit. Um, our 22 projected um, versus the 22 budget, um, gross patient revenue was down, um, projected a budget about 4.5 million Net patient revenue was down about 3 million. Um, as Bob mentioned, we did have a busy first quarter of 22, but then we got hit in January with a lower volumes due to the COVID variant. Um, and the volumes really quite haven't rebounded to where they were in the first quarter of the year. Um, our other operating revenue for 22 was the 5.9 million, which includes the, again, the three and a half million um, for the USDA grant and the provider relief funding. Um, we did not budget for that in 22, which is the, the bulk of the difference between the 5.9 million and projected in the 22 budget of 2.4 for other operating revenue. Um, projected to 22 projected to 22 budget for expenses are up by about $2.3 million. Um, the travelers comprise most of this variance for 22. Um, again, we had budgeted 1.2 million for travelers this year, and we're going to end up with uh, $4 million by the end of the year, we think. So that's about a $2.8 million variance just for travelers. Um, and then we project, which we've Bob talked about in an earlier slide, but we project that we're going to have about a $300,000 margin this year, primarily due to recognizing the three and a half million of USDA and provider relief ARPA funding. Um, so you can see without that funding that we would be in a much different position, um, probably a, around a $3 million operating loss without those funds this year. Um, and then lastly, the, the 23 budget column, the last column, um, budget to budget, there is a large increase um, for gross patient revenue. $5 million of that is volume driven, and the remainder of that is the 10% rate increase. Um, that net, net patient revenue difference um, we had talked about in the earlier slides and what components are and the utilization and the rate components of that. Um, other operating revenue um, basically is consistent with our 22 budget with the difference being about 300,000 due to the, the remainder of the provider relief funding that we're expecting to, to take into revenue next year. Um, expenses um, will increase 4.5% 
um, projected a budget um, that's primarily due to staffing and inflation. Um, and then we're projecting to end up, as we, as I just said, with the operating margin with a $1.7 million margin for this year, um, which is a 2.8% margin, um, which we'll see in the next slide will basically um, bring us to a break even um, point in terms of cash. A lot of numbers here. Okay. So this is just a summary of our EBITDA and cash flow. The EBITDA, we're taking our operating income of $1.7 million and adding back non cash items of the income statement, which is depreciation and interest. That gets us to $3.1 million and then um, removes from that amount um, cash obligations that are not in our income statement, which is our principal debt payments. Um, pension expense funding, and then um, the $1.5 million that we have earmarked for capital purchases for next year. And you can see that basically is um, a break-even cash flow for us. Um, next slide. So this is the last slide that I will be going over um, before turning it back to Bob. This is on our day's cash on hand um, from year to year. You can see in 2019, which is the year that we filed for chapter 11 um, in June. We had 17 days cash on hand at the end of September. Um, 2020 um, to 23, we've basically been pretty consistent in the 40 days cash on hand range. Um, in 2020, we received $5.4 million of CARES Act funding just after COVID hit, which helped our cash. Um, and then in 22 projected, um, that includes the receipt of $2.8 million of the provider relief and ARPA funding that we received. Um, so overall, we're projecting um, to be at the end of 23 in that low 40 days cash on hand range, which is about just over a month and a half of cash. Um, so we're pretty fragile um, from a cash standpoint. Um, we have the lowest reserves in the state, um, at least um, according to the Vermont Digger back in March. Um, that's primarily due to our chapter 11 that we had gone through um, over the last couple of years and everything else that we've gone through. Um, we are showing that the data, um, there's more than half of Vermont hospitals has more than six months of reserves. That was as of September 30th of 21. That's probably changed since that point um, from September to now, um, but it basically, this is showing that we have no rainy day cushion um, with 40 days cash on hand. And so we feel that the 10% rate increase is crucial to our sustainability um, moving forward. Um, I do wanna point out before handing this over to Bob, I wanted to, to give a quick overview of our budget process that we go through. Um, and just to say, there's a lot of thought and process that is put into our budget. Um, this is an extensive process for us over a five month period of time that we start late March. Um, we begin the process of our budget by um, pulling together historical and budget data. Um, we, send those for our we send those to our department managers for review. And we feel it's very important to involve our managers in the process of our budget so that they understand our finances um, the managers review data that we give them for historical and budget, and then they provide input on the resources that they need for the 23 budget in order to provide patient care in their departments. Um, they go through what FTEs they need, they go through what supplies they need, what services they need, um, and also have input into the volumes in their department. Um, they also go through a very extensive um, analysis of what capital needs they need for their departments and then provide us with a list of what those needs are and break those down by high priority, medium priority, and low priority. Um, that process is about uh, you know, up to two months and then there's another two months that we spend pulling the budget together. We take the volume, um, you know, the utilization, we turn that into gross patient revenue, net patient revenue, 
Um, we take the FTEs that are budgeted. Um, there's a lot of time spent um, calculating, you know, what wages are based on FTEs, based on current rates, um, adding a COLA onto that. Um, and then we also have to factor in the cash needs um, based on, in addition to those things, based on their capital needs. Um, then we have to um, present this to our finance committee and our um, our board for approval. Um, and then after that, we complete all of the budget requirements for the Green Mountain Care Board submission. Um, and then a month or so after that, we spend on the presentation, creating it and getting ready for it. So I guess just wanted to point out that it's um, important um, that we're, a lot of time is spent putting this budget together um, and for the, the budget that we're presenting today. Thank you, thank you, Kata. And I do want to recognize the work that Kata and her department have done, along with um, Anna Smith and uh, Crystal Moray in our office, who do a lot of the work on the present. Crystal does the numbers, and they do a lot of the hard work on the slides and the research behind uh, the strategies. And um, also, just to point out the way this has flowed into our process this year, because we did complete our strategic planning initiative in the spring where we rolled up all of our stakeholders and constituents into um you know to uh to arrive at a at a strategic planning process for the hospital which has also rolled into this process and then the final piece of that which we'll talk about a little bit later is uh, we have just now completed our um every three year community needs assessment and we are now we now have those preliminary results and those then those results will be flowing into our ongoing planning process as we go forward the next couple of years. So I was going to stay on the agenda. I was going to talk a little bit about our um, our progress that we've made with diversity, equity and inclusion, um, which we basically in fiscal year 22. In the fall, we started our training and education initiatives with our employees and with our managers. And those processes um, have been ongoing throughout the fiscal year. Um, we are now moving to for we're now moving to the next phase of our program, which is to actually develop our own DEI committee. And uh, that committee will begin meeting in September of this year and we'll we'll work on developing our, our strategies and best practices regarding racial, social, sexual, and gender, gender diversity. Um, and so again, you know, that, that will be paired up with our organ, organizational wide education promotion. And then we also are joining in with our community health equity partnership, which is being sponsored by the Springfield Health District. And um, we'll be participating in that to tie the hospital's efforts to those of the communities with our DEI efforts. So next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about our wait times. We conducted the wait time survey uh, during the first two weeks of June, and um, we we uh, learned quite a bit about this data. Uh, one thing we we know we have pretty strict uh, standards that we like to return all patient inquiries within 24 working hours. Um, I think I think we were pretty pleased with some of the of the results that we got here. Um, our specialty practices are doing a great job. Uh, there's they saw their patients within two weeks of the scheduled date. Um, one of the ones where we had some challenges was around podiatry, which was a new service for us. And because we had limited availability, um, you know, that schedule filled up quickly and got backlogged in a big hurry. And so we're now adding days to that schedule as well. And again, our podiatrist is the only one in the community. So, you know, if you, if you, if we don't provide that service, then our patients have to leave Springfield and leave the community to receive that. Um, Cardiology, we have a great partnership with Cheshire. Uh, their physician that we have helping us here is fantastic, um, but that is a part-time service. And so that was another area where we had some wait time delays. Um, 
but all the other ones um, we thought we thought um, were pretty good. So um, next slide, please. Just kind of going through a summary again of, of our risk and opportunities. Um, again, continued shortage of skilled healthcare professionals and staff uh, tends to be one of the biggest challenges we have now is is recruiting staff. Um, rising, and of course, this has led to rising labor costs, both in terms of having to rely on travelers as well as um, you know driving um, increasing cost in the market for us to remain competitive for staff. We still have a lot of uncertainty about COVID-19. I just want to remind everybody that you know COVID-19 is still with us, and we still have uh, patients in the hospital that have COVID, and we have patients that are coming to the emergency room that have COVID, and we are have luckily we're having less of this, but we still also experience employees who are exposed that either are positive or we have to have them quarantined so that they don't expose anybody else. And those shortages, again, um, cause problems with staffing and ability to take patients in our, our capacity. Inflation is anybody's, is anybody's wild card, although we believe that a lot of the inflation impacts that we felt in FY22 um, are rolled up in our run rate for those costs in 23. So a lot of that's built into the pie there. Uh, supply chain disruptions. And again, we've had difficult, we've also had difficulty getting supply items, but the substitutes we've had to turn to many times have been much more expensive. Our opportunities going forward um, center around continued focus on our revenue cycle. Um, this is an area that we think we uh, have opportunities to improve our performance as an organization. Um, continuing to reduce travelers, um, developing and implementing new services to meet the needs of our community and improve access in our community. Um, and in our strategic planning initiative, it helps us continue to understand, you know, what are the needs in our marketplace and acts in it. But what we can see by our preliminary um, assessment, excuse me, um, availability, accessibility, and affordability are um, big issues in our marketplace. Talk a little bit about our, a little bit more about our strategic planning process that we went through. Um, our process. Um, was conducted in the spring, the winter and spring of this year, <laughs> excuse me, and it involved all of our staff. So this was a completely top up process where we started off with soliciting input from our staff, our medical staff, and then we drove that data through our senior manager management team um, and through our board of directors and um, our consultants at QHR Health um, helped us to facilitate and organize that process. So we had some really good help with some folks to do that uh, for a living to help us. Um, we identified three key areas of focus, which we will be um, emphasizing in the upcoming year. First is to stabilize our finances in our processes. Two, to identify and invest in our core services. And what are the things that are, are needed in Springfield? I mean, what access is necessary here um, what what should we provide and can we do that affordably here at our facility? Um, and then our probably our most important one is to continue to develop our people in our culture. You know, as a small hospital, we have a very, very much family atmosphere here at this hospital. And that is one of the things we do best is to um, is to have neighbors taking care of neighbors and have a family oriented culture here. And so we'll be aligning those um, those products from our uh, strategic planning process, we'll be aligning those with our community health needs assessment. And again, the two biggies that we're seeing come out of that are access to care in our community and affordability for care in our community. Those are, our, those are the two of the biggies that are coming out as preliminary findings. Uh, next slide, our value-based 
participation. Uh, we are, um, we have um, agreed to continue participating uh, in 23 in the same products that we were in in 22, which is uh, OneCare and the Medicaid product, um, Blue Cross and MVP. Uh, we are going to not participate in Medicare. Um, and in, as, as we as we look at any of these value based products, uh, we want to make sure that they support you know positive cash flow, um, and provide you know stability, and and um, reduce our risk because you know we have have been in such a fragile financial position. I mean we have to constantly evaluate how much risk we can accept as a hospital. Next slide, please. Talk a little bit about our capital investment plan. Um, this slide uh, rolls up our key capital initiatives that we are projecting to undertake at this time. The first one is the renovation of our nuclear medicine department. Um, our equipment there is quite old and unreliable, and we, matter of fact, don't hardly ever do any nuclear med uh, now because of the condition of that service and we are we are we are now evaluating replacing that equipment and it will require the renovations to the room and to the radiology department to accommodate that also anticipating acquiring a new c arm for our operating room that's used by several of our specialties most importantly urology and um, orthopedics we have a couple of aging pieces of equipment in the lab our blood culture and chemistry analyzers. Um, we're also um, uh, having a community fundraising effort right now to replace our IV pumps that are used throughout the hospital, and we're anticipating having to um, focus some capital on that, as well as some either a replacement or some refurbishments to our nurse call system. And then we've put 270000 aside for miscellaneous and unanticipated capital items that will either be replacements or, or things that, um, you know, in some cases, some of these may be revenue um, generating opportunities that we don't have equipment for now. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, over on the building side, we have two or three important building projects that we're going to focus on this year. Most of them involve our um, HVAC equipment and the mechanical engineering systems in the building, but we expect of, of most of that expenditure to be funded through the USDA grant that we mentioned earlier. So that covers our capital priorities for the year. And then we have on slide 40, we have wanted to make a few comments about the supplemental data monitoring. Um, we spent a fair amount of time analyzing the data that we were provided um, and it, it we had some interesting findings. Uh, the one thing I want to point out most importantly about, about our analysis was the decrease in market share that we've experienced during this time. And we've had several things happen, of course, and we talked about them earlier. I mean, we've been through a senior leadership change in this hospital, which rolled over into the hospital declaring Chapter 11. And then while we were in Chapter 11, we were in the midst of taking care of the community during the pandemic. And then during that process at emerging from Chapter 11, we split with our parent organization, which required a large amount of restructuring, which by the way, again, that there is still, we are still working on, on the relationship and um, getting that, that finished and right. There are still some parts of that that are not completely finished. Um, and so, um, and then we think about the changes in absolute. So those things have all had a negative impact on our volume. Plus we've had some other things that were more systemic changes as part of our reorganization. We did close the childbirth center. So if you look at us from a, a service standpoint, um, a lot of the, the tough things that, that were done here structurally on the hospital were done during the chapter 11 process. Um, the Wyndham Center was closed temporarily for renovations, which reduced utilization. Then the center became the COVID positive unit for psychiatric patients for the state. 
And again, as Kata mentioned, um, our census was very, very low there, and the uh, fees the state was the state was paying us for to hold the unit on standby, those were not counted as net patient revenue. They were counted as other operating revenue. And so that um, we've also seen some declines with our partner, the FQHC. They've seen a decline in visits, particularly around the same time that we saw our volume plunge as a result of the Delta and Omicron variants. So their volume also went down during that period also. Um, and then we also had a change a couple of years ago in our emergency department providers, and that have impacted our net patient revenue because the previous provider, the hospital was doing the billing and the net patient revenue was flowing through our model and now the provider bills separately. So that, that was a shift in revenue too. So we, we believe that these are significant things that affected um, the data in the supplemental data portion. Let's see, next slide, please. A few other market share points to, just to make. Um, the, the data does exclude Vermont residents that are seeking care out of state. And in our region of the state here in the Connecticut Valley, that's pretty significant because a lot of uh, tertiary services that we don't offer are provided in New Hampshire. And so a lot of those, that, volume and that revenue flows across the state line um, in that direction. Um, many of our service line numbers are not statistically significant because we have small numbers because we're such a small hospital. And again, again, we've had service line changes which have affected our overall volumes in terms of the emergency department, urology, uh, the closure of the OB service. Um, so a lot of these numbers are not are very, very small after those changes are taken into consideration. And then finally, if you look at our population, our population is, is older and our um, poverty is increasing in our marketplace. So these, um, you know, so I think our health determinants, social determinants of health in our marketplace are um, also a challenge for us in our hospital. Chasing my book around. So uh, just reiterate the impact of COVID on our hospital. Um, you know, we've experienced, um, you know, reduced staffing throughout the year due to COVID exposure. People that were ill with COVID or were quarantined uh, for protective purposes. So that's affected our staffing and, and those downturns in staffing have affected our volumes on many days. Um, we have been hit like everyone else in the country with the great resignation. Um, we've had staff who have just left, and um, hopefully they're going to return to the healthcare marketplace because we need their uh, skill and training. The timing of the Delta and Omicron variants and how that affected our utilization. I mean, our patients stayed home in droves when those uh, variants hit us, and that definitely affected us on a revenue standpoint. Um, we did learn a lot about our incident command and how to work very well as a team, inter both internally and externally with the various um, other agencies in the state and across the region and with our partner hospitals. And so we have, uh, we're certainly much better at doing those than when we started. And again, the value of our relationships with the local hospitals, our colleague hospitals, agencies, and with the state, uh, um, can't say enough about how strong that process has worked during COVID. And it's really been one of the things that set Vermont apart. The success we've had here, it's uh, been one of the things that set us apart from some of the other states, is being able to work together and coordinate those things. Um, still have lots of vulnerability due to supply chain disruptions uh, and unexpected expenses due to COVID. Uh, we still don't know what's out there or what's going to happen. and. Um, you know, how will inflation continue to affect us? Uh, when it's winter in Vermont, uh, we don't know, we can't predict what heating oil is gonna cost today when it's when it's uh, winter in Vermont. And uh, by the way, my first winter in Vermont was quite cold. So I'll just mention that. So, um, 
Okay, next slide, please. So this brings us to to our, to the conclusion of our presentation. So uh, we're we're still in a very challenging marketplace. Uh, the world for healthcare is still a pretty hard world of uh, it. Uh, but as you can see, our um, our resilient hospital is continuing to thrive despite these challenges, and we're continuing to grow. And uh, just consider how far we've come in the last four or five years due to the hardships and challenges that this hospital has has encountered. And so I really want to thank all of our team here at the hospital for their hard work and extra effort that they have put in to uh, to, to get the hospital where it is today, because it's certainly been a big challenge and we would not have been successful without the hard work of our team here and the support we've received from our community, from our board, and um, from the state and every and everyone that has been behind us cheering for us during this uh, challenging time. So uh, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and let me echo that, you know, gratitude for all the hard work that you've been doing and um, continue to do and all the work that your community is doing as you know, your staff, your frontline workers. You certainly, Springfield does face unique challenges, I think, with uh, the Chapter 11 restructuring, the leadership changes that you've experienced. Um, and thank you for coming in and, and taking over that uh, ship. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, the acuity, the demographics, the socioeconomic status of the, the patients that you serve only magnifies the hardships uh, that I think all hospitals are facing right now, in particular for Springfield. So thank you for all that you are doing. And I skipped over that process. We we are now analyzing our acuity and our CMI. And we have, over the last five years, we have seen a consistent gradual increase in our case mix index in the hospital. So our patients today are sicker than they were when we started this process. Yeah. And so we've, we've been looking at, we we're getting into repealing that back and looking at that because when we go on the floor and we, we talk to the caregivers and we look at the staff, the patients on paper, we can see that they are getting sicker. And, um, you know, we are, we're rising to the challenge of that change in acuity here. Yeah. Well, I, I, as one more member, I can tell you that I appreciate that work. Um, I am at this point, I'm going to open it up to the questions from the board. And I've, I've been starting with Robin. I'm going to continue to do so. So board member lunch. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bob and Kata, for your presentation. Um, so one question that I'm going to ask all the critical access hospitals is to talk a little bit about uh, your fiscal 22 uh, financial pressures and how those will flow through into your Medicare cost report. And in your particular situation, it sounds like uh, at least some of the traveler's costs may be reimbursable through some of the federal funds that you receive. So how does that all interact, the federal funds, the increased expenses in the Medicare cost report? Well, that's a complicated question. Um, that's why we, I'm asking we have, you guys. So we, <laughs> we've, we've, we've had, we've had, we've had a, again, we've had, we've had a lot of unexpected increases and um, where we are today is, is different to, and where we thought we would be a year ago, um, you know, I'll probably have to defer to, to Kata. We do, we are planning on taking some of the grant income in the grant in proceeds into income because those are be, will be taken versus additional COVID expenses. So we feel pretty confident that we will be able to comply with that, which is why we have built it into our projection for 22. To we've anticipated that we will be able to take that income. Um, from a cost report standpoint, um, Kata, what is our num what is our number now? We're about uh, maybe I'll ask Mike, what are we at, Mike? 38% now on the cost report factor. Um, outpatient wise is uh, about 38% inpatient and we really don't calculate it on a percentage. It's calculated on a per diem. Uh, the one oh. thing, the, I'd like to answer the question about the cost report impact. When it used to be we hospitals would wait until they file the cost report to know the impact of the cost reports. 
and um, we uh, put together a cost reporting model that we use quarterly to determine what the impact of the of the year to date Medicare cost report effect is, and we actually book it to our, our general ledger. <clears throat> and then five months after the close of the year, we file the cost report. We we compare the as filed cost report to our preliminary projections and make an adjustment to the as filed cost report. So when we did the budget this year, we took the um, model, we 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 rolled in the budgeted trial balance, we rolled in the budgeted volumes, and we calculated what the impact of the Medicare cost report would be, and we incorporated it into the uh, net patient revenue from Medicare. And um, it's it's a it's a pretty um, intensive program. But once it's set up, it works pretty well, and it can be utilized for, like I said, a quarterly review, um, a comparison to the as file cost report, and to uh, be able to um, calculate what the budget impact would be on the changes we made. So it did have a little bit of impact. I believe it improved, in, improved the, um, the reimbursement a little bit in terms of um, outpatient um in in the in the budget thank you thank you that's helpful and i'll just um, uh, robin yeah, i'll ahead. just mention that kata kata just no sent me a note that she was uh kicked out of the system for for a moment so she's she's attempting to log back in so she's missing for a moment so. okay well if we need her for a question we can i can move on to a different question we can circle back if that works for you Okay, certainly. The, the other option, of course, is to just note it and you can uh, come back after the hearing if, if needed. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, any cost savings initiatives you have underway and or that are reflected in the 23 budget. So could you speak a little bit to how you approach, approach cost savings year to year and this year in particular? Well, this again, this hospital went through quite a bit of restructuring um, due to the financial difficulties. So a lot of the, you know, we have become very diligent about the our expenses at this hospital. So we're very cautious about what we approve and what we authorize to spend. So we're pretty tight on the things that we do. Uh, we work very closely uh, with our department level managers on expenditures. Uh, during this time, particular, we we have tried tried through the last few years to defer as many costs as possible and to economize on as many things as as possible. Um, the thing that's kind of caught us this year, I think, is in addition to the travelers, has been some of the supply issues. You know, that's that's been hard, and I'm I'm a little concerned about the uh, the heating costs this winter. So hopefully, um, th th those prices will continue to go down before it gets cold. So but I think it's a daily it's a to answer your question though it's a daily it's a daily task for us to tr to try to hold on to the cost savings that were built into our operations a couple of years ago. Thank you. Um and in terms of the travelers it sounds like you were budgeting for about 15 travelers uh, and you've reduced the expenses a little over a million from your 22 projection. Um, could you speak in a little, or if Kata needs to talk about this and we need to do follow up, that's fine. I was just wanting to know a little bit more about uh, how you came up with that million. Are you assuming travelers costs will come down? Are you assuming some of your recruit and, recruitment and retention will uh, keep more employees and so you're reducing the number could you just walk me through that a little bit more well we're, we're anticipating all of those things to happen uh, we are seeing a decline in the rates although i don't think it's been as pervasive yet for us as some of our colleagues have noted uh, but we believe that that is happening uh, the, uh, we also have a couple of staff members that are international staff that have agreed to join us 
arrested have been held up in the immigration process. And so we have at least two RNs that are that are uh, we are waiting to bring to Springfield that have have not been able to be processed through the immigration process because the embassies and a lot of those um, processes have been either closed or slowed down in their home countries. And so we we know that we are hopeful that we're going to get two or three of those staff members um, in this fiscal year, uh, which will reduce cost. Um, so rates, we're, and we 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 are focusing on our recruitment process. So we're hoping that we will people will come home to work, and uh, that we'll be able to hire some people back. Thank you. Um, I had a question about one of the tables on page three of your submission, um, which is so you you have table two dash one and two dash two, and I'll give you a moment to to get there. Uh, page, three and this, on the page three on the slides or on the narrative? On the narrative. Okay. Um, and these tables show NPR for fiscal year 23 change versus the first one is the approved budget and the second is the 22 projected. And I was noticing in the approved budget, there's a sizable decrease in total commercial. And I was curious uh, what was kind of driving that. And I was wondering if maybe some of that was moving the Medicare Advantage from Medicare to commercial. Hi, Robin. Um, I apologize to my, the key, the teams kicked me off. So I was off for about 10 minutes trying to get back on. I had to restart my computer. Um, I'm sorry, Kata. Uh, it just ha happened to happen, you know, right now out of all times. Of course. Um, yeah. We did um, send an updated workbook um, with, ch I believe, changes to these particular um, tables. But okay. to answer your question, I do think we did move um, Medicare Advantage, which was in the commercial bucket last year, and we moved it to the, the Medicare bucket for this year. Um, okay. So I think that is the, the reason for the decrease in commercial. Okay. Great. I, I thought perhaps that might be driving that, but it was such a, a big negative compared to the projected that I wanted to understand that better. Um, and since you've sent a, an updated, so I did have some other questions about some of the tables and stuff, but I haven't seen your updated workbook. So I think I will just pass on those, assuming um, that if, if they're not answered in the updated workbook, then I'll talk to our staff about it. Um, in looking at your slides, and I apologize, but the printout that I have does not have slide numbers on it, but it's the COVID graph, the COVID impact on volume graph. Yes. Um, I was curious if you had any additional information under um, underneath the the trends to, that could speak to what type of services you were seeing declines or flattened related to the spike in COVID cases. I'm asking this because one of the area one of the analyses we saw in the rate review process spoke to um, there being a a pretty direct correlation with emergency department and urgent care utilization but that at least on the insurer side, the trends seem to be that uh, reduction in other sorts of services kind of caught up within a few months. So if you looked over the course of the year, um, you know, things sort of equalized except for that ED and urgent care. And I'm wondering if you saw something similar or if you were just seeing completely different type of service trends um, in ref ref when in when you're looking at the COVID impact or whether you don't know because you didn't look at that type of analysis. This the slide with the COVID impact was basically us testing our hypothesis because again, when we were in front of this board a year ago, um, the volume trends were, were strengthening and improving and we actually had pretty good months in September, October, and November last year financially. And yeah. um, we were we were accomplishing 
the projections that we talked about with this board a year ago. And then when the first, when these variants started hitting people, you know, the volume went away in droves. And we, this, this graph was intended to test to see whether that was our imagination or whether that was true. And when we grafted it against the state volume, we discovered that it, we, we believed that it was true that, you know, it definitely affected us on the volume and the revenue side. Um, do we, do, I mean, we can go back and look at how it affected us. I would say the big place where it affected us in this period was probably on the inpatient med surge census. Okay. And Al-Qaeda can speak to that if she thinks I'm wrong or right, but I think it was on the inpatient census that it hit, it hit us mostly. Um, after we got past the first of the year, we started having some of those capacity problems at Wyndham with people being out and being quarantined and sure. things like that. So that that affected some of our census during that period when right. we would have normally been completely full. Great. I guess I would just add to that. So we keep our, um, we have a, a volume trending that we keep month by month and it's by color. So. Um, the green is the highest volume point of the year and the red is the lowest volume point and we call it a heat chart. And in that big dip that we had in January, we're seeing a lot of reds, the lowest volume point for a lot of the ancillary outpatient services primarily. And it was almost across the board. Um, so a lot of the diagnostic imaging departments and um, outpatient departments, um, we did see a, a slight decrease in the inpatient census, but it was also the, the outpatient ancillaries. Thank you. Um, related to the oncology change where you're, you're switching from inpatient to telemedicine, uh, which restricts uh, the, the chemo access, I'm, I'm just curious where, you're, where you think your patients will end up uh, moving to for chemo? Do you think they'll go to Dartmouth directly? And if so, does that mean that they can then be served by telemedicine in the future? Or do you think they'll be switching hospitals completely? Or if you have any uh, any thoughts on that, which understandably you may not know. Well, I do, well, I'll have some comments on that. One is we have very good partnership with Dartmouth and they provide the physician staffing for that program. And we have worked closely with them. Uh, you know, this is, this change is driven by a shortage of providers on their side. And so what it, so what has happened is these were basically outpatient infusion therapy patients that were receiving chemotherapy. And the when we when we changed the model, um, we the patients that were very stable, we were able to continue to provide chemotherapy on the ones that were in prog process. Uh, but they were reluctant to initiate treatments on new ones unless they sure. were present during that yep. time. And so those patients are those patients for those treatments now are are going to one of the Dartmouth sites. Um, and we're trying to make the telemedicine available here at Springfield for access convenience for our patients because that group is a very, very um, you know, fragile group. And you know, having them travel, we're trying to minimize the travel they have to do. And so, if they can see their physician for a telemedicine visit rather than make the trip, then we're trying to we're trying to do that for the benefit of our patients. Excuse me. But none of the none of these were inpatient, Robin. They were all outpatient treatment. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, I I think I understood that. What I was not understanding is how that's going to flow to the future. Like when you're like, will there be new patients? Obviously, for the initiation of treatment, that should be done in person. But then once it's initiated, will some of those new patients then transition to telemedicine or will they always stay in person at the other place? That's the piece of it, the future looking piece that I was trying to understand. Well, right now, the way it's working is we're expecting the latter to happen with the new patients. We're expecting them to Got receive it. that treatment at one of the Dartmouth locations. Now we will be able to do other infusions in that. We will continue to do other infusions in that center other than chemotherapy because there are other drugs we infuse other than just chemotherapy. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll, given the time, I'll go ahead and stop there. Thanks. Great, then I'll turn it over to board member Pelham, please. Thank you. And thank you both for your, your presentation. 
Um, I'll be quick here. I want to just start briefly, uh, um, kind of following up on, on one of Robin's questions. When on page four, you had the sentence that said the hospitals classifying Medicare Advantage plans in the Medicare payer category for 23, it changed from FY22 where it was classified in the commercial payer. So I went looking to try to find what that meant and I went to the payer mix tables um, and you could see that the Medicare for the year over year column was up 43% and the commercial was down 12%, but there wasn't any um, specificity about you know how much was related to, to uh, this change. And so I then went to the reconciliation table thinking that maybe it was under a uh, change in accounting practices, which is one of the, the lines there. And that was blank. So um, in order just to get a better sense of, of how, I mean, because from an NPR point of view, that's a zero sum game. So in order to kind of understand the shifts, you know that detail. I think unless it's somewhere else in the app in the application, I just missed it. But um, um, maybe the uh, reconciliation table might be the place to put that. Um, so that's that. Um, on a topic which you know, I, I for some reason have uh, gravitated toward um, uh, the provider tax. Um, I noticed that. If you take your 2023 provider tax um, um, allotment at 3,526,000 and you divide that by 6%, you come up precisely to your NPR FPP value. Um, so the chances of that happening by chance are, I could have won, won the lottery or something. It's, uh, uh, it, but it, it, you know, that your allotment for provider tax divided by 6% comes to 58 million. $778,633 or something like that, um, which makes me think, because most people are calculating the provider tax against their um, prior year um, NPR of PP. Um, and so um, that would uh, uh, put you in the position roughly of applying it to the 51720000 which is your 2023 projection. So I know there's a lot of nuance to the calculation of the provider tax, but I don't think it applies the to your current to to the, the 2023. Um, what you pay in 2023 in tax relates to your 2022 NPR FFP. But I also know that different hospitals approach it differently, and there are nuances. To that, like I learned today, that swing bed revenue do doesn't count. So there's, you know, there's some um, some noise there, but I, I I think it might work to your benefit to kind of take a, a deeper dive into the provider tax and the calculation method. Um, I also was looking at uh, kind of at, on the income statement where um, the you have fixed prospective payments. Um, and you have them fully reserved um, on the income statement. And so I went kind of looking for where that was and those fixed prospective payments are in Medicaid. Um, and so I'm just wondering why you feel you need to fully reserve um, those fixed prospective payments, especially given that Medicaid um, it doesn't require you to reconcile. So, I'm assuming you're talking about the adaptive and how it's shown in there. Is that what you're basing yeah. the information on? So we treat it like that in adaptive because it's it's rolled up in our net patient revenue and it's including in our Medicaid NPR calculations and it's not really split out. So that reserve or that amount that's in adaptive is our actual payments that we receive. Um, so it's to demonstrate the actual payments, but the net patient revenue for that is just kind of embedded in our on a, in our Medicaid NPR. So I guess that reserve is just to show that th these are the payments that we receive, but this is actually in our Medicaid NPR. Um, so we're, we're not essentially fully reserving for that. It's just a presentation. I guess it's how we're putting the information I into see. adaptive. Yeah. So the way to so the way to read that is that your Medicaid NPR includes the fixed prospective payments. Um, exactly. And on the income statement, you're just kind of 
separating that out and neutralizing it um, just to kind of show. Right, um, exactly. Interesting, interesting. Okay, well, um, and then finally, my final question, I as, as kind of by listening, this is our, our third hospital, um, is getting a sense of when the fever might break on travelers. You know, at some point in time, I'm just, uh, you know, you read how the the kind of the uh, the multiplier that that is being paid to agencies and to travelers over um, regular staff, and um, you know you see numbers like uh, you know two hundred percent increases and two hundred and twenty percent increases. I mean these are big numbers and powerful forces in every hospital budget. And I'm wondering if you just can get a sense as to when the fever might break from your experience that people don't want to be travelers anymore. I mean, if they're to make 120% of what they could make, you know, at your hospital, they, they're, they're not coming and they're, it's just not going to work. And so is it, uh, I, I to frame this question. Do you think the traveler situation, the, the economics of the traveler situation um, are long lasting over a number of years um, or will the efforts that the state is making to um, uh, in terms of its workforce efforts to um, uh, unravel the traveler problem, that those might take hold sooner than later. I mean, there's no, there's no precise answer to this, but you know, I'm not in the field. I'm not seeing this. You know, at a visceral level, and and you folks are, and uh, just wondering when when you think this this thing might turn around. Well, that is a um, good question. Uh, one that we don't really have a, a scientific answer for. I mean, um, there's no doubt that it has resulted in a seismic shift in hospital expenses. And when the when the, the when we, when the high tide recedes to low tide, uh, we're still going to probably be left with a lot of increased hospital cost across the nation. And, not not only driven by that, but also driven by the great resignation, because just my crystal ball, I see a lot of people that are at or near retirement age in healthcare that have stopped working during this period of time. And before they return to the labor force, they're going to be retired fully. Now, how do you quantify that? I, I, I don't know, but... Mm -hmm. um, you know, the largest cohort of the baby boom is probably 64 to 65 years old. And to the extent that that group um, stepped out of the labor market temporarily, um, if it takes a couple of years to step back in, they it, they may never step back in. <laughs> you know, if they, mm -hmm. they've decided that it is time to, to retire because working in healthcare is pretty, um, is pretty hard and it's certainly more challenging now than ever before with the rising acuity of the patients. And, you know, one of the things that, the other things that we're seeing with a lot of bedside staff now is the impact that um, violence and abuse is taking on them because we've had a lot of people, a lot of, uh, of our staff have been assaulted and either physically or verbally abused by, by patients and families um, because everybody is very frustrated out there now. And, and maybe to a certain extent scared of what's gonna happen but I mean, certainly there's a rise of violence and abuse um, among our staff, so. Well, thank you for that. I, I just, uh, I mean, I know it's too early in the process, but sometime I'd like to get a sense of when the tide might turn on travelers, because my guess is then there's quite a bit of one-time money or two-time money or three-time money built into hospital budgets that might be able to be redirected to um, to uh, you know other concerns that you have, and right now you're just you know paying for the travelers. But at some point, this could up your capital budgets and other budgets. So that's all I had. Um, thank you again. I, I do think I do think we it. have to um, we have to make working in healthcare and in being healthcare professionals, we have to make that more attractive for younger generations because it's got to start. You know, it's got. To, we've got to start training the next generation of of caregivers, yep. and, and that's got to be an emphasis for us now. So, 
Well, this process has been labeled the stabilization budget process. And uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of work over the next year in terms of the legislation that was passed by the state. But uh, if this, if uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure that 2023 will be the stabilization year. Um, so um, I'll return that, you know, the, the mic back to Jess. On that optimistic note, thank you, Tom. <laughs> uh, Board Member Walsh. Thank you, Jess, and hello, Kata, Mike, and Robert. It's nice to meet you. Um, first, I, I think I want to echo something Jess said earlier. I want to just um, thank you for stepping into such a difficult situation and, and trying to uh, do the best that you can to take care of your population of patients and our um, Vermonters. Right? It, it's um, it's not an easy task. Um, I don't. I guess my my one question was <clears throat> about um, how are you trying to understand the needs of the patients, the increased patient volume in your ED? Are you taking steps to try to understand what those patients may need in order to um, you know not require as much urgent and emergent care? Is there any? Are there any initiatives going on to see what might be behind that? Well, we are doing some work on that now, and um, we work. We're working closely with One Care and with our our primary care partner, you know, North Star Health. Now, looking at that to try to um, look at utilization of emergency room services to be sure that it's appropriate and. Um, you know that the care is being delivered in the right setting, and yeah. so we're partnering yeah. with um, with One Care on that right, right. now. Good. I, just, I I think it's um, part of trying to understand our, the needs of the population we serve, right? To make sure that we have the um, the we optimize a mix of primary care and secondary services, and building um, a practice model that's reliant on secondary services at a time when um, prices are going up, premiums and out-of-pocket expenses are going up. As those out-of-pocket expenses are rising for patients, they're less likely to seek care. Some become uninsured, others become underinsured. Um, and so um, that downgrading of, of insurance coverage and people not going to the hospital or not going to their care provider until it is urgent or emergent leads to higher acuity, uh, more uh, time in the hospital, and it also um, leads to more unplanned and unreimbursed care. And you can see a, a bad cycle that would start where if our um, rising prices are leading to less utilization, then we, we try to make up the difference with higher prices again. Um, it just it becomes a big burden on, on our communities, and there's a big burden already with out-of-control inflation. So I, I think it's, it's understandable when people, violence isn't understandable, but it's understandable that um, patients, when we're encountering them, are extremely frustrated. Um, and it, I just, I worry about, um, overly optimistic utilization assumptions when the out-of-pocket expenses for the community are rising. I think there's data to show that they're less likely to utilize healthcare um, unless it's emergent. Um, so that's just a note of caution about, about um, the utilization predictions um, and trying to think through what, um, are we designing a system that meets the needs of the patients that we that we serve. So, um, well, I appreciate that, those comments, and that's exactly what we're doing. And the res the preliminary results of our community health needs assessment support the strategies that we have put in this plan. Because what people are telling us, two of the most important things that we've received from as community input is access and affordability here, and and do providing the care that's appropriate for this type of hospital locally and in a more cost effective manner and making access more convenient for the patients. And so that's kind of what this is. Our plan 
today is built around those two or three important points for our community. Yeah, I, I pre we we share uh, a desire to do all that, Bob. And um, again, I appreciate uh, you stepping into the role um, at such a difficult time and trying to to steer it. Uh, a better course. Um, that's all that I have. Um, back to you, Chair Holmes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so a couple of questions for you. Um, this is a question I've been asking all the hospitals, uh, realizing that the change in charge request doesn't always or often does not uh, correlate with what the effective commercial rate experienced by the typical commercial you know, patient in your hospital. Um, some hospitals have been able to answer it in the hearing. Others have said, I will get back to you on this, so that is fine. But effectively, what I'm trying to understand is what is your historical relationship between change in charge and what the typical commercial ratepayer experiences um, or typical commercial patient experiences on the ground in terms of uh, the rate increase that they will face? recognizing that you have a whole portfolio of payer contracts, but on average, what would we expect uh, the relationship to be between change in charge and effective commercial rate so that we can then get a better sense of what does this 10% change in charge really mean for the, the commercial patient coming in your doors? So probably directed to CADA, but recognize that that may not be something that you can just pull out of the hat. And if you need to just circle back with Sarah Lindbergh, that would be fine. I think it's well, something that we'd have to, you know, to look at in our end. It's not something that I can just, I don't know that number. Um, don't think, Mike, you do either off the top of your head. <laughs> Mike, I think you're on mute. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I think that's a good idea to uh, put something together that shows uh, the the impact um, not only by commercial, but also by um, what the impact on Medicare and Medicaid patients would be as well. Um, one thing that we do know is that for our self-pay patients, we have a very uh, effective financial assistance program and that self-pay patients, when they apply for financial assistance, will will get the full resources of that plan and and, and have some benefit to them in terms of being able to um, afford the cost for the self-pay patient. Okay, uh, that would be you know, helpful. The, the, the numbers aside, I'll just comment on the complexity of the mechanics of this process because we have multiple payers with multiple contracts and there's, there's notice issues and um, implementation issues. And, you know, so it, it's, there's a lot of parts in this process, it's not it's not simple and straightforward. So, no, I recognize that. So, I appreciate that. I think it's really helpful for us to understand really what is the the, the real impact of this change in charge increase. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the narrative, you mention heavy market competition and current uh, pay levels that are below the market. And uh, you know, given Springfield's location in the southeastern part of the state, where there are other hospitals nearby, and in particular a very, very large tertiary care center that is is rather close um, in distance, I wanted to ask you about their new patient pavilion, right, with its 65 brand new spanking beds that are slated for completion this fall, opening sometime in 2023. And while I, I think this is going to be wonderful for patients and it may be wonderful for relieving some of the capacity issues, some of the transfer and throughput issues that we've been hearing about, you know, from other hospitals and reading in the narratives. Uh, one of the, the concerns I have is that staff may be lured uh, to work at Dartmouth-Hitchcock if they are within vicinity of both Springfield and Dartmouth-Hitchcock. You know, it's a brand new facility. They have deeper pockets, probably better way, easier ways to pay. You already said in your uh, narrative that you know there have been below market rates. So I wonder also, you know, how's that going to impact your hope to get away from travelers and to you know retain your employees? And also, what impact does that large new bed tower have on your projections for average daily census? I know you walked us through some of your utilization assumptions. I never heard any um, 
comment about how your utilization assumptions will be impacted by Dartmouth-Hitchcock's expansion. And I noticed that you're increasing your average daily census you know, projection for next year from this year. So I wanted to know if you could speak to how you're thinking about whether that is a risk to you in terms of staffing and, and whether it's a risk to you in terms of daily census. Well, I think def definitely any um, large change in the marketplace has potential for negative effect on the other hospitals in the service area. Um, I think you named the ones that we would be most concerned about, which would be the effect on the of competition in the labor market. So I think those are the ones that would affect, that I'm most concerned about as we look at this. Um, you know, I still think that there are primary care services that we do very well, that we're very price competitive with that we do here that should, that it, and it's very appropriate for us to do them here. And, you know, I'm, I'm expecting that we will remain competitive with those, you know, in, in the upcoming year. I mean, if you look at the increases in volume that we have budgeted, the, the percentage numbers might look look large but when you look at when you look at what the absolute changes are they're really relatively small so you know can we um you know like for example the psych change is like one one patient day right we know that there's lots of psych demands all over the state we just have to can, can we can we capture those patients and can they are, are they the right patients for our setting and our program and the same thing with med surge we you know, know that there's delays at certain, sometimes there's access or waiting time issues. And if we can be prompter with appointments and prompter with operating room times, can we do those cases if they're appropriate for us to do? So yeah, I share your concerns, particularly about the competition in the labor pool. Um, but I mean, our, we do have a very good relationship with that hospital in terms of, of their our tertiary partners for the things that we don't do. And, you know, there's a lot of cases that we do that um, are appropriate to be done here. So how will it affect us? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I can appreciate that. Um, I just didn't hear you talk about it or reference it in a list of the risks. And so I wanted to bring it up. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, and I do have some concerns about uh, some of the utilization projections. Um, in light of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock bed tower, in light of board member Walsh's comments around, you know, cost sharing is going to be increasing, potentially. Um, you know, we're seeing increases in health insurance premiums that may lead people to drop down in metal levels, have higher cost sharing. That may translate, often does empirically shown, translate into lower utilizations. Uh, the other piece that I think is worth, you know, discussing at least is the the public health emergency. To the degree that that's removed, there may be some Medicaid redeterminations that take place, and where those patients end up uh, may also impact utilization. To the degree that they end up uninsured and then delaying or postponing care, or even, you know, in a uh, very underinsured, you know, plan. So high deductible plans. So I, I, these are all things that I'm thinking about, and I'm wondering if you know the Medicaid redeterminations have also weighed in on your um, mind in terms of utilization or payer mix or what happens to free debt and you know. Well, we're we're working very closely. Our partner in our free market is Va is Valley Health Connections, and we work very closely with them on our financial assistance program. Mm -hmm. And I know that they're doing a lot of work with this group of patients now to make sure as many people can continue to be qualified as possible. Yeah. Um, it's, I, mean, I, I, I just wanna fully appreciate all the uncertainties that you're trying to make a budget around. Um, yes. So, you know, I, I think we, none of us have crystal balls, but mm -hmm. these are just areas that, that strike me. And I, I, at the end of the day, what I really worry about is, um, you know, when there's projections in the budget that are, potentially aspirational, I'll just call it that, if there's utilization numbers that you're hoping that you're going to get, and Springfield has not always met the targets for NPR, but the, the cost structure is built around achieving those uh, NPR targets. And so then when those targets aren't met and they're built around a utilization assumption that may or may not manifest itself, I worry about your uh, 
sustainability, right? Making a margin next year. And you've been successful this year with making a margin, but it's largely based on grant funding, right? So, you know, will you go back to negative margins um, if the utilization doesn't materialize? So that's, you know, I'm trying to figure out what are the error <laughs> margins around these utilization assumptions. Mm -hmm. And given the uncertainty, I think they're quite large. But the swing then for Springfield is, is also then quite large in trying to make that margin. So any and all information, I guess I would ask that you have it. If you have any more data that could support the utilization assumptions that you're making, um, broken, you know, I understand it's podiatry, I understand it's urology. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the differential? You had two part-time OBGYN, that's one full-time OBGYN. You said that, that there's a delta there. How big is that delta, right? You went from eight days a month and I think it was, but is it? I can't remember now whether it's urology or podiatry. And now it's ten days a month. What what is that delta? Is that really going to contribute the utilization that you're anticipating? You have a general surgeon that you're recruiting for. How long does it take to recruit and then ramp that you know that provider up to the to to meet those utilization assumptions? So any uh, if you have any additional data or assumptions around that, I think that would be helpful if you could share with um, Sarah Lindbergh and the team. That would make me feel better with this with this budget that you're submitting. We can do that, but I will just comment, you know, particularly on those three, those are areas where demand is current is exceeding current supply now, and that's why we're increasing the availability of those specialties. I mean, podiatry has just been very underserved in this market. And again, we're con we've throughout the course of the first year of that provider, we've continued to add days due mm -hmm. to to demand on the the appointment book. And the same thing with urology. Urology has gone has is doubling in coverage due to the availability of patients calling and the demand for it. So so it's answer? not putting it's not putting the doctor out there. It's not the it's not build it and they will come it's they're they're calling and wanting to come but we don't have a place for them to go now so no i mean it sounds like you're really meeting unmet need in your community i'm just wondering is I mean, is there is there capacity to even add more to the to either of those practices you know add more days so that you could really for sure meet those utilization numbers well on gyn i we will add some other we will add another provider of some sort in that specialty to allow us more call coverage and to be, to have another set of hands for for larger cases and more complex cases and so we, we are working on that second part of it right now but but those three particularly are areas where we're expanding because the demand is there right yeah i know i i appreciate mm -hmm. that and i wasn't questioning mm -hmm. the demand was there i was questioning mm -hmm. whether the incremental increases will you know make enough of a difference mm -hmm. um so I guess my last uh, question is, you know, since the budget was submitted, um, if you could share, and again, this is something you can do in a follow-up, any known or likely changes to any federal and state payments, any relief funds, any donations or grants, or any unexpected increases in Medicaid or Medicare that you have, you know, learned about since the budget submission or since, you know, that's not incorporated in the presentation today. That would be helpful if you could follow up with um, Sarah's team. So I think that is it from me. Uh, board members, do you have any follow up questions before I kick it over to? I see he's shaking heads. No. So Sarah Lindbergh, do you have any uh, questions from our esteemed staff? Uh, no questions. Uh, Sarah Lindbergh, head of the finance team here at the Green Mountain Care Board. Just want to say that uh, we'll be following up. We want to make sure all your material is up to date and uh, sorry that we haven't been as proactive in making sure that uh, that's all in place. So uh, that's a little bit of a growing pain for our team. So uh, appreciate your partnership and uh, we'll make sure the numbers are correct and tie out. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. We appreciate your help through this process. and We know we've called you a lot. So thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Happy. I, I, I like to joke I haven't been on the phone this much since the 90s. So it, it's just refreshing. <laughs> well, it was it was us calling. Never mind. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, I'm going to ask then the healthcare advocate uh, if they have some questions for Springfield. Yes. Uh, good to be with you, Sam Peich, health policy analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Good afternoon. A couple questions from our office. 
the first thing, I just want to commend you on the health equity commitments you talked about previously with the health equity initiative. Look forward to hearing more about what comes of those collaborations. Um, but our first question refers to, so on page seven of the budget narrative, you talked a bit about Medicare Advantage plans not coming in according to contract and that you're working to resolve it. I was just wondering if you could provide an update about the status of resolving that issue and what impact you imagine it might have on this current or projected budget. Um, I think that that question is again pertains to the mechanics of implementing the rate increases as they have been approved and which ones are some of those contracts are subject to rate increase limits that are already built into the contract. So um, I'll let Kata comment on that, but I think it's referring to the mechanics and the complexity of that process. So, you know, obviously we go through uh, doing the larger plans in priority, and then we still have some other ones that we're still working on. And so there's always a timing issue with that mechanics of that process. I think the thing with our Medicare Advantage plans is that they they pay or su are supposed to pay the same rates as our Medicare um, rates that were being paid. And so there's always um, a delay when we receive a Medicare rate letter that our rates are changing. And we received two this year. We had a rate change in February and another one in May. At that time, it's up to us to identify all of the Medicare Advantage payers that our rates have changed and that you you know, these are the new rates that Medicare is paying us. So we're not getting that increase from the Medicare Advantage payment, uh, payers at the time of the Medicare increase. Um, it's not simultane simultaneously done. There's always either a 30 to 60 day lag, depending on, you know, the minute you get that rate letter, you have to let all the payers know, and then they have, you know, 30 days from that day to implement. So there's, there's always a delay in receiving um, the payments that I guess they're supposed to be paying us because of the notification piece of it. So that probably wasn't clarified in the narrative, but that's basically what it comes down to. And we received a Medicare rate change in May, um, which we've notified or we notified all of our payers at that time. And um, we're confirming now that we're, we're getting the Medicare rates that um, they should be paying. But is basically resulting around the delay. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you for yeah. clarifying that. Um, the next question refers to responses that you gave as a part of the supplemental data monitoring. You noted during the time frame from 2014 to 2019, the Springfield Hospital HSA reported an aging population, the percentage of people 65 plus increasing to 22%, which you said was the highest of all HSAs. And you've talked about today increasing poverty in your HSA and yet you serve an elderly and high poverty population. With these figures in mind, I'm wondering if you can speak to the fact that you have the highest debt to free care ratio of all the hospitals, this is based on 2021 actual, which is a ratio of 4.7 to one. So I'm wondering if you could talk about the obstacles to providing more proportionally free care relative to bad debt, given these challenges you talked about. What what is what is the ratio you you quoted, Sam? Four point seven to one of bad debt to free care. I mean, again, I, again, I would refer back to our financial assistance process. You know, we we handle all of these the same. Um, we have a very good partner locally in Valley Health Connections who helps us with our financial assistance process. So people that are eligible for financial assistance are processed through the partnership with that agency. And I think they do a really outstanding job of it. Um, so I don't know, Kato, do you have a, a comment on it? I don't really have a sense as you're saying that bad debt as a percentage of the the free care is four times higher. Yeah, it just is a ratio. Yeah, um, it's one of the. I mean, this is. I mean, it's not surprising. I think that our office is hopeful that more of that uncompensated care can be shifted 
to free care rather than bad debt. Um, so that's, I mean, we have an access and affordability concern, which motivates the question. Sam, could I just jump in for a second? I mean, yeah. at 4.7, um, you know, I, I question whether your contractor is actually doing such a great job, because at least compared to the other hospitals in the state, um, you are a huge outlier. Um, so I guess not to criticize that, but I think that's a space to look at and given the consumer angle or the impact on consumers, I don't think it's adequate to say the organization that's handling it is doing a good enough job because evidence would suggest it's not. And then so, and our last question is related to that. You talked about in the narrative on page 12 in the management and contract services line, increased costs related to a patient billing vendor. I'm not sure if that's the one that you just alluded to. You said the cost of these billing services increased as a result of higher collections during FY22 and are now included in the current run rate for FY23. Given that this seems like it would increase your own costs, and we know historically from data that the likelihood of retrieving bad debt from Vermonters is historically quite low, we're wondering what obstacles you have experienced to, rather than shifting that. Why, like, what obstacles are there to shifting that to free care rather than allocating more to trying to increase collection activity? I don't know if that's that vendor is not only doing our self pay collections, but our follow up as well. So it's not just um, our self pay collections that that is referring to. Okay. Those are all my questions. Back to you, Chair Holmes. Great. Uh, at this point, I would love to open it up to public comment. If there's anybody here who has some public comment. Yes, I see Dale Hackett with your hand raised. Take it away, Dale. One quick one on bad debt. Sometimes I wonder if the reason the person won't um, engage in services being offered is that they're afraid that by the time the services are utilized, there's enough of an outstanding debt that then if the collection process is aggressive, that turns them off from the whole process because they get scared. And I've heard this mentioned, I haven't been able to join on every hospital presentation, but if there's any feedback back on that as far as something scares them away. I I really do believe that um, when obviously there is help that could be helpful, but is it helpful enough or it, is there a negative in there that would be very important to the consumer? My second question is more about uh, Jessica, you mentioned the beds that Dartmouth was going to open up. I'm wondering how much there is communication between Vermont hospitals and Dartmouth, and Dartmouth has a sensitivity to, while they may have the beds, helping us keep services in Vermont that will serve Vermonters. And I know I've had some situations where I've been down at Dartmouth because services weren't available in Vermont. But if they could bring somebody from Dartmouth up here as a, a team approach to provide those services, then you're keeping them local. I know I've had physical therapy issues where I ended up at Dartmouth because a surgeon wanted me there and I strongly felt like that's what the surgeon was familiar with because as soon as I realized that that's physical therapy could actually be done up here, I immediately transferred it back here myself and said, hey, there's no reason for this. I can get this up there where I live. Um, and I immediately saw that as 
come on guys, communicate. Uh, I don't necessarily want to, you know, travel an hour each way just to find out that I could have gotten on a bus and gone a half hour away and gotten the same service. Um, your feedback on that in terms of, I don't know, my feeling as a consumer was we need better communication and I recognize there's complexities within the system that can keep what seems very practical from happening. We seem to hear that a lot. And a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. I don't know if Bob and team, you have any comments that you might share on the bad debt experience at Springfield and then maybe talking a little bit about some of those opportunities and the relationship that you have built with Dartmouth Hitchcock with respect to sharing services um, to keep care local when possible. Well, I'll, I'll just say that we need to we need to look into the bad debt versus free care ratio a little bit more to make sure we understand how we're categorizing and what's in what category. Um, I do, we do have an initiative that we're working with our local provider that we're working on on that right now. So I think that we have a good relationship and I think the sir, the agency does a good job for us. So we just need to look at the whole, the, all of it. Um, our community health needs assessment, you know, cost and affordability was one of the top issues identified in that. So we're very sensitive to making sure we meet the needs of that. Um, and I guess, I guess the thing that that uh, Mr. Hackett just spoke about, we're very much in agreement with, and that's coordinating within the system so that we provide the right care at the right place. And you know, we have a good communication with that tertiary partner and we work closely with them and um you know we we rely on them for a lot of the services that we cannot provide and they were one of the best hospitals anywhere you know for that but we do work very closely and communicate with them to keep care appropriate in our local community great i appreciate that and dale um your hand is still raised do i assume that you have not put it down yet or do you have a second question I do not have a second question. I just forgot to lower the hand. Thank you. No worries. Okay, I see Ham Davis with your hand raised. Go ahead, Ham. Uh, thank you. I just want to push your question a little bit. I, I want to ask the, uh, the Springfield team, uh, when they've talked about utilization, they've talked about the needs in their community, uh, what's available in their market or not available in their market. Um, I, I think I understand his answer to your question, but I'd just like to confirm it. When when he when the uh, when Springfield talks about its market, does it consider Dartmouth Hitchcock part of its market? I will turn that one over to you, Bob. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of looking at service areas. Dartmouth is in our service area, and um, you know, if you look at hospital discharges from our primary service area, quite a few patients <laughs> do go to Dartmouth. So it, there's an overlapping service area there, but I'll also say because of the nature of their tertiary services, their service area is much larger because those specialties have a much larger catchment area than ours do. Right, but isn't the question, sir, is, isn't the question really when you're talking about designing your service lines, and the question of which is more on the as care tends to get more uh, complex, it tends to get more lucrative. Okay, and so one of the questions in all of these smaller hospitals is uh, is the uh, uh, is is the trying to keep as much um, volume inside your own your own hospital. Okay. Um, a response to the actual needs of the community or is it a response to the needs of the financial needs of the hospital that that's my concern and i so that so i think that's what and and i i'm i'm not i don't speak for, i'm not speaking for jessica holmes okay but but i i i think that i think i heard that in her question that that's that is a real issue thank you well okay. to the extent to the extent that a service is needed um you know by a patient and we believe we can provide that service and it's appropriate at our level and it's the right care at the right place and hopefully it's at a cost competitive advantage 
and it's more convenient for the patient. So, I mean, those are the, those are some of our factors. If it helps us with our cost and revenue structure, then, then that's also positive because we do have certain fixed costs that we have to support here to have any hospital open. I understand, but I, and I don't want to be mean, I, but one more statement. Did your, sir, do you know whether the, the, uh, the surgeries that you carry out meet the leapfrog volume standards? I, I don't know that, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ham. I appreciate that um, line of questioning. And I think at this point, it's 2.30. I don't see any other hands raised. I'll just open it up in case there's somebody who is waiting in the wings that wants to make another public comment. Is there anybody waiting? Okay, seeing none, hearing none, um, I think what we'll do is we're gonna take a 15 minute, I'm being very generous this time, recess. We'll come back at 2.45 to hear Northwestern. A Springfield team, I wanna say thank you to you all for coming and for preparing these materials. And you know, I know you're doing a lot of incredible work trying to, to turn around the hospital and, and provide care for your community. So I know our questions are tough, but I, I do appreciate the work that you're doing, so. With thank you that, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming today. And um, let's come back here at 245.